Uh, so welcome to our third conservation career chat. Uh, today we will be talking with Christopher Starr, who is the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager, it's kind of a long title there, uh, with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, we do these on the third uh, Wednesday of every single month. So next month we will be focusing um, for April on uh, game wardens or our conservation officer, uh, Travis Shepler from Nebraska Game and Parks will be joining us. Uh, today, like I said, we have our aquatic invasive species person. He's going to be talking all about his job, his kind of journey to get that job. Um, so please feel free to ask questions either in the chat um, or if you would like to um, unmute yourself at the end, we can certainly have a good conversation with Chris afterwards. So um, otherwise, I will go ahead and hand it, the reins over to him. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys it. Please feel free to ask questions. This is very informal and I hope everyone um, learns some great stuff. Awesome. There we go. Um, can you see my, my my slides all right? Cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Monica. Uh, yeah, like Monica said, my name is Chris Starr. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager for Demon Parks. I started here in Nebraska in September. Um, so I'm going to be talking about kind of my journey from when I first got into the field all the way through um, coming to Nebraska. And I've had some pretty interesting experiences along the way. So. Um, so, you know, one question I get asked a lot is, how did you get into that? You know, people assume that I grew up just loving aquatic life and snorkeling and all this stuff. And, you know, I, I really didn't. I, I grew up, you know, going out on, you know, and, you know, just testing a line in my local lake, but I wasn't crazy about it. Um, and actually, I didn't even know this could be a job um, until I went to uh, college at South Dakota State. So I was going there. Um, to look at majors and I was looking at history and then I saw this cool major called wildlife and fishery sciences and I had never heard about that before so um, kind of how, how I first got into it is by luck um, the history a professor canceled on me for my visit and I only met with the wildlife and a professor and that's what I majored in so again it's not some big you know epiphany so um, on the slide I actually have um, the photo arc, Joel Satori from here in Lincoln, actually, uh, for National Geographic, um, when I worked in Arizona, um, these are some of the most endangered species in the world. And, and this is a spike base found in the Gila River Basin. So just to kind of give some context to the cool uh, picture on the photo. So, you know, while I was going to school, you know, um, I really found and I heard from a lot of people, it's very important to get, you know, separate internships and stuff. So I started looking around, um, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to work with wildlife or fish. And actually, I really wanted to work with ducks. I just thought ducks were fascinating. I wanted to go ban ducks and be a duck biologist. So, you know, I applied to a bunch of different internships. And as it turned out, uh, the job I got was working with aquatic invasive species for the Iowa DNR. Um, so that was the very first job I was offered. And that was the only job I was offered that summer, uh, my freshman year. Um, so yeah, I started working with aquatic invasive species and I did not know a single thing. I was green. Um, as you could be so, but I got a lot of good experience on a lot of different ecosystems. And this is the Cedar River in downtown Cedar Rapids, um, where we're uh, where we're an electro I'm shocking for Asian carp. So if you heard the Asian carp or the fish that jump out of the water, you know they're found in the Missouri River Basin and stuff like that. So that was some of the coolest stuff I got to do. Um, we also worked a lot with zebra mussels. So we went all around the state sampling water. We were on the Mississippi River sampling fish. So again, for someone that had never had any experience, it was, it was like the perfect first job. And that's what kind of got my love for working with aquatic, you know, species and stuff like that. So yeah, if it wasn't for, you know, maybe if the duck biologist had called me back and offered me a job first, I would be talking to you as a waterfowl guy. But it's, um, yeah, it's always not quite as straight as you think it is for your, um, your path. So, so yeah, I went to school at South Dakota State, and then I got another internship working in the beautiful Nebraska Sandhills. So um, we, I got the opportunity to do some undergraduate research um, in the Sandhills um, for a whole summer. So, and if you're not familiar with the Sandhills, they're actually the largest and most complex wetland system in the United States. And they're, they're, it's such a unique place that I think, you know, if you're not from Nebraska or you know, you've been up to Valentine area, um, it's, it's kind of hard to appreciate the beauty. And, you know, it's all formed by wind action, which is really, really cool. 
you know, if you look at it from the air, you can see how all these little lakes are made from wind and ice. Um, and they have some of the most unique species in the country too. So, you know, I didn't know that at the time, but, you know, you know now looking back, that was a really cool place um, to work. So I got to do a lot of work um, pretty much by myself with one other technician um, sampling fish and zooplankton, you know, little microscopic animals and doing aquatic vegetation surveys and stuff like that. So that was really, really fun. So, but we were really focused on bluegill. So, you know, if you know about the Nebraska Sandhills, bluegill is kind of the big thing, you know, in some of those lakes. So, you know, I got to do some research on bluegill nesting, you know, why bluegill nest in certain areas and stuff like that. So, um, you know, and one common thing with all of these internships and stuff is I had a really good person to work for that let me kind of grow and do things that I wanted to. So that's a big, you know, that was a big, you know, thing to look for, for internships and stuff like that. So, you know, got to sample a lot of different fish, again, fish that I had never seen before, you know, like Northern Pike, you know, being from central Iowa um, and some big bass. And then I also got to do a lot of cool studies on how to age fish. So if you're not familiar, all fish have um, ear bones in their head, much like us, and they put down a ring um, for each year they're alive. So you can actually remove that, um, that, that, uh, uh, that bone, it's called the otolith, and tell how old the fish is. Um, but actually what I got to do was work on larval fish, so fish that were days old. And, and when the fish are this young, they put down a ring um, for every single day they're alive. So, you know, the picture in the center here is from a larval otolith, and you can actually count how many days that fish has been alive. And that's really, and, then, and that's really important because we can, you know, you know, look at hatch rates and stuff like that to look at how our populations are doing. So again, stuff I never learned before, I never knew about, I had no idea growing up that there are ear bones and fish and people could age them and stuff. So yeah, just, you know, the more experiences you're exposed to, the more you learn. So, um, so, but I also got to work with the Iowa DNR um, in Southwest Iowa. So yeah, this was my third internship um, in college, right, you know, from my, uh, you know, right before my senior year. Um, and this was working in Southwest Iowa doing a lot of management stuff. So the lakes on Southwest Iowa are very, very different than here in Nebraska. They're more like ponds. They're really, you know, a lot of vegetation and things like that. Um, and there's also a lot of good pictures of me, as you see here on the boat, electrofishing, catching nets, um, not wearing a life jacket. So um, that's a, Things you do when you're young, you probably uh, look back on, and now I'm like, ah, oh, I can't believe I wasn't wearing a life jacket and some of that. So always wear your life jacket, guys. So, um, but I also got to work a lot with aquatic vegetation. So we were doing studies um, to look at how to introduce native plants into some of our lakes and reservoirs. So I got to go snorkeling and diving to um, actually collect some of the buds of the plants. Here I am in some lily beds collecting plants and stuff like that. So again, you know, one thing I've kind of found out from all my experiences is sometimes you find yourself doing something you never thought you would be doing. So, um, and, and each time you do that, it adds a little bit to your, you know, your resume and stuff like that, that people may not have. So, so I got done with college South Dakota State and, um, you know, I, I looked around for jobs, but, you know, from my advisors and the people I work for, um, I was urged to get a master's degree, you know, because that's, you know, right now it's, it, it can be a hard field to get into um, and to get to the biologist position, you kind of have to have a master's. Like you don't have to, um, you can work, you know, technician jobs and things like that, but that's just the route I went with. So I went to Oklahoma State for my master's um, and my master's project was working on largemouth bass. So I got to work with a plant called American water willow. This plant here, I'm, I'm getting out of the lake and uh, the Department of Wildlife in Oklahoma wanted to plant this in some of their lakes and reservoirs because they had really windy, muddy lakes that nothing would grow um, for bass habitat. So I got to do a lot of stuff in the field and in the lab um, working on that. And then I also got to assist with some side projects. Probably the most fun thing I did in, um, I did in uh, grad school was work with a flathead, a catfish. So I was assisting on a project and just seeing some of these big giant fish that again, I had never even think about is pretty, really cool. And then the last, you know, kind of project I did in Nebraska, uh, sorry, in Oklahoma was working with paddlefish. So we got to assist with a couple paddlefish research projects and actually got to go um, catch them on rod and reel um, for measurements. So um, yeah, you actually get paid to fish, which is the only time in my life I've ever been able 
to say that. So, and we caught some big paddlefish, um, you know, measure them, you know, see if they're males and stuff like that. So yeah, that was were some of the experiences that I, I, I really enjoyed in grad school. I was there for two years and um, yeah, I think, you know, that's something that some folks should look at kind of getting in the field too. But so I got done um, with my master's degree and I applied for jobs across the country uh, from Florida to Virginia to New Hampshire to you know, all across the country. And I actually did 24 different interviews before I got my position. So even as competitive I was, um, I, I had to really search around. So, and the place that um, I ended up going to, um, I was Arizona and I had never been west of Oklahoma before. <laughs> um, I had never been to Arizona. I did a phone interview. So I, I packed everything I owned and drove west um, to, to um, Arizona. Um, and, and this was a lot different place than I am really used to, you know, I'm, I'm a Midwest flat guy, you know, um, and working with mountains and high elevation and, you know, some of these mountain streams that had wildfires and things like that. It, it was, it, that was a big change and I had no experience at all working in that. So, you know, just because you may not have the experience that this, you know, the job is, but, you know, um, you know, is, you know, doesn't mean that you have the skills to do it. So that's one thing to keep in mind to not be afraid to apply for positions and stuff just because you think um, you may not have experience. So. Hey, Chris, we had a someone in the chat message me and said, so you said you had 24 interviews. How do you yeah. not get discouraged after not getting 24 jobs? How do you um, keep going? That's a great question. And to, to be honest, I, I, I was kind of, you know, discouraged, you know, I, I kind of thought I had done, you know, everything right. You know, this was a few, you know, this was back when, um, you know, a lot of the state agencies weren't, weren't hiring a ton too. So part of it was timing, but yeah, I did get discouraged, but, you know, I, you know, once I kind of found the love of doing research and working with all these cool species and stuff like that, it's just sort of, you have to keep on going if you really want to do it because I've seen a lot of people too um and, and it definitely crossed my mind to maybe look for a different choice maybe go teach high school science or something but um yeah it's just something that you gotta keep going if, you, if that's something you really want to do and you know it doesn't always work out but you know I think more more times than not it does so but no that's a great question so and that kind of leads me back into Arizona like I, I had no experience working with a lot of these species in Arizona um, because I was working with trout and I had never worked with trout in my life in streams. I, I only worked really in big rivers and lakes and stuff like that. So that was a crash course. I had, I, I really had to get a crash course in, in, in just different fish species and how to sample them and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was a big, big eye opener for me. So, um, and yeah, and I got to go to some really cool places. I think that's the thing I remember most about being in Arizona and it's kind of the perks of the job is I was out in the field all the time. So we were doing stream surveys and hiking, you know, 10 miles a day. And I, uh, you know, I think one of my favorite times um, is when I got to go actually go out and track rainbow trout. So we were doing a study to see um, how many miles or, or, or how far these trout would move when they're stocked in some of these mountain streams. So um, so we would put these radio tags and do surgery on the fish actually and put a radio tag inside with the antenna sticking out and then we can go in the stream and actually track exactly where the species is, uh, where, you know, where that, um, where that individual fish is. And you can see in this picture on the left, right below me where the antenna is pointing at the water, there's a fish just below my feet. So I get the beep on there and you can hear it. And it's kind of like you get um, closer and the beeps get louder. Um, and faster. So yeah, it's really, really cool. But, you know, I, I got to, I, I got to spend a week just camping um, up in the mountains and I had no cell phone, no radio service. I had to hike up on a, um, a hill to get radio service to call back in. Um, because the places are so remote in Arizona, they actually have a search and rescue plan. Um, so, so, so what happens is, is if you don't call back in at a certain time, they initiate the search and rescue plan. So you have to check in um, you know, at least every day to make sure you're still there. So, you know, cause you're, you're, you're literally by yourself and doing things like that. So. Uh, someone asked what happens if the fish with the radio tag gets eaten or what if they die? Um, that's happened a lot. Um, when I was working here, we had ospreys 
um, on some of these uh, streams and you would point the antenna up at osprey nest and you can just hear the beeps. So you know that there's ospreys up there. So you can kind of mark, you know, make that note. Um, but we also have fish that die just naturally in the stream. And you know, we go kind of the way you know that is if you keep going to that spot every single day and the fish doesn't move. Because sometimes the fish you know, accidentally expels the tag. So the, the tag itself just falls out of the fish. So yeah, there's a few different things we can do to kind of do some detective work and, and, and try to find out um, you know, where fish go, but we also have fish just go missing. They just, whether it, 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 it swam way upstream or, or, you know, or was taken by a, you know, an osprey or a hawk way far away. So yes, yeah, strange things happen uh, sometimes. So. so yeah, I got to say, I got to see and hike in some really cool areas and kind of the, there's two, there's a couple of experiences that really stand out when I was just working in Arizona. Um, and the first was to see bighorn sheep. So um, I actually got really close to this ram while I was out hiking um, on a stream for trout. So it, it was really, really cool to see, you know, for someone that's never seen that before, like me, that was like very incredible uh, to see. And then we also got a call when I was working in the mountains too, you know, cause it is remote. Um, some conservation officers had tranquilized a bear that had wandered into a campground a couple of times and needed help um, transporting and tagging it. So we actually stopped by and got to tag um, a bear on the ear tag and they were gonna go uh, transport to some other spot from there. Again, not, and I'm not a wildlife guy. I've never seen a bear before. And like being that close was just crazy. So again, the things you do on your job may not be exactly your job duties. You know, so, what I found a lot is is uh, you do some really strange things, and and sometimes when you get you know asked to help out, you get to do some really cool stuff. So, um, but a big part of my job too in Arizona um, is I worked a lot with colleges and um, and high schools. So you know a lot of the um, high schools and colleges um, in, in, in the Valley in Phoenix, you know, don't have a lot of opportunities to get outside. So, you know, we would do labs where we would bring kids outside and show them how to sample fish and stuff like that. And, you know, that's, that was probably the biggest joy of my job was actually getting these kids out who have never, you know, you know, who, you know, who've always wondered, you know, what's below the water and they get to go out and see that. So, and it, and it makes them for some pretty fun experiences, you know, you know, trying to educate people, you know, on what species and like, you know, they're all excited about, um, you know, what they caught and stuff, you know, but also some people aren't super happy with the fish. I remember this guy, he, he was not happy about handling the scarf and, uh, um, but yeah, they had a fun time. So that's another part of my job that, you know, um, you know, I, I was kind of allowed to do That's It's not really in my job duties and that's just something I wanted to do as well. So, so then I got a job. Um, so my job first in Arizona was a sport fish research biologist. And then I took a, a higher position in Northern Arizona up by Sedona, if you're familiar, um, as a native aquatic research biologist. So I worked at our department's aquatic research and conservation center, which housed only uh, native threatened and endangered fish species. So um, we were the only facility in the country that actually had some of these species in captivity. So part of my job was trying to find out how to spawn all these different fish, but, you know, because there's no handbook, you know, we, we need to make more so we can stock them back out in the wild, but no one knew much about their biology. So, you know, we were kind of going from scratch on doing just basic research, like how many should you throw in a tank to help spawn, you know, and things like that. And, you know, that was, you know, and, and, and that was really, really fun. So again, things, you know, I had never had any experience doing that too. So, you know, just because it's something you haven't done before doesn't mean, you know, that, that, that you can't learn and adapt. So, um, and then I got to work on a really cool project trying to spawn a fish called a Sonora sucker. So it's a native fish in Arizona. Um, they can get quite big and we wanted to see if we could spawn them um, to use as, as native bait fish. So there was a uh, concern um, for aquatic invasive species. Um, you see in, in Arizona, um, there's not a lot of fish that are native. Bass aren't native. Sunfish aren't native. Catfish aren't native. You know, minnows aren't native. Bullfrogs aren't native. So, you know, a lot of these things they're worried about getting spread into the waterways and then they cause fish, you know, the fish that haven't evolved with them 
um, to go extinct or, you know, in some cases, or, you know, in, in a lot of the fish I work with, you know, go threatened or endangered. So we worked on uh, this Sonora sucker to make for a, like a native bait fish to see A, if it could be spawned at all. Um, and then if it could, whether it could be ramped up and people could use them um, as bait that's a native fish instead. So, so we actually, um, again, and there wasn't a lot known about this fish. So, you know, we, we walked around and looked at the literature and looked at what other people have done. And we actually ended up um, capturing adults in the wild with nets and we brought them back to the lab and we injected them with hormones to get them all um, spawning at the same time. And then we were able to spawn them or, um, by ourselves. So here's a male fish that you see that's milt um, that the male is expelling. So we know the fish are ready to spawn. So what we do is we, we, we spawn the eggs from the female. It, it doesn't hurt the fish, you know, the fish are anesthetized when we do this. And then we put the milts or the sperm in with the eggs. So, and then we actually make it ourselves. We actually mix the eggs in the milk I mean, and then we put them in jars and stuff like that to hatch. So um, this has done a lot on fish that are really hard to spawn that won't spawn in tanks or, or in kept, and, you know, or, or in labs and stuff like that. So that was really cool. Again, I had never had any experience with that. Um, but we were, what we were able to find out is we can spawn some our suckers. So here's some cool um, pictures I took from our microscope from the egg stage and everything like that. Um, yeah, and that, and that had been the first time in Arizona that we had spawn some our suckers. So, and that was really, really cool to kind of take ownership of that, knowing you kind of helped spawn this fish. So yeah, we, we, we set them in these jars on the right with constant running water, um, because if we didn't do that, um, all the eggs would stick together and die. So yeah, and, and as you can see, we actually got larvae. And then, you know, this is what juvenile we got eventually. So yeah, and we found that, you know, although we can't get them to spawn, it's incredibly hard. Um, like I said, I, I, you know, we had success. We only had one female and two males spawn. So all these so it wasn't super successful, but you know, at least we found a way to do that. So that was, you know, that was really, really cool. So, um, and the last project I worked with in Arizona was working with endangered fish um, in the Colorado River, you know, through Grand Canyon and stuff like that. Um, I worked with what's called a razorback sucker and a bony tailed chub. And, you know, some, these fish are probably some of the most endangered fish um, in the country, if not the world. So bony tailed chub, uh, the fish on the right, um, at one point in the 80s, the population known in the world was down to about 20 fish. They sampled the entire Colorado River and found around 20 fish and brought them back to the lab. And that's what saved that fish from extinction. So, I mean, you think about just how close some of these fish were to extinction. Um, and, you know, a lot of this work with native fish really got my passion because I was a sport fish guy. I worked with bass and bluegill, but it really gave me an appreciation of our native fish and a lot of the struggles they have. So. And the big problem um, with razorback sucker and bony tail chub is they don't spawn in the wild. So they're only being kept from extinction um, by stocking them from a hatchery. But the problem that we have, uh, oh, sorry, that they had in Arizona, um, is that they get eaten a ton. So um, they, about 95% of the fish they stock get eaten, even at 12 inches long. So we're talking even bigger fish getting eaten. Um, and you know, the reason why this is, is kind of for lack of a better way to explain it, um, hatchery fish are kind of dumb. So they're used to being in a tank. They've never seen a predator before. They're used to getting fed every day. And so here's a, um, a, a picture from one of my experiments um, is that uh, when put in a tank with a bass, these fish will try and hide underneath the bass. So, you know, they, they're, 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 they're pretty much asking to get eaten. And it's because they never learned that kind of um, how to avoid predators. So uh, my last research project was actually trying to expose um, these naive um, bony tailed chub and razorback sucker to largemouth bass. So they would learn that when the bass chased them and ate them and stuff like that um, to avoid predators. So, you know, we would put these bony tailed chub and razorback sucker in a tank. Um, and, but, you know, the problem that I had is, um, is that we couldn't have the bass eat all our endangered fish because they're endangered. So you can't just throw a bunch of fish in there and the survivors are the ones you have because you know that they're, they're kind of a limited resource. So the idea I came up with was injecting largemouth bass uh, with Botox. So um, Botox has been used before in some other fish studies. And what it does is paralyze the jaw muscle of the largemouth bass. 
So, you know, if you ever look in slow motion how a fish eat, it kind of sucks fish into their mouth. So they can't open their mouth fast enough to eat a live fish, but they can still chase, you know, the, you know, the, the species around and snap at them, but they can't consume them. Um, it doesn't hurt the fish. It actually goes away in a few months, and you know, and they can still eat, um, you know, dead fish and and uh, and and artificial um, stuff too. So, so yeah, so we actually got to buy Botox, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, I found out that a microgram of Botox is about three dollars. So, and there's a thousand micrograms in a milligram, and you know, a house fly is about eleven point five milligrams. So, at the rate that Botox is to buy. A house fly would cost sixteen thousand dollars. So um, it is one of the most, and Botox is, is one of the most, um, actually one of the most poisonous substances to humans as well. You know, we use it a lot for cosmetics and for migraines and things like that. And this was non-human grade Botox. So, yeah. But to procure um, Botox, the name is botulinum toxin, um, was really really hard when you have to explain to someone you wanted to buy Botox to inject into fish muscles. People were were kind of think. Uh, I was a bit crazy, um, but yeah, but, but, but so we were able to buy some, but um, I actually had to sign an FBI waiver saying um, to know where it is at all times in case people started getting unauthorized Botox injections around Northern Arizona, they knew where to go to. So yeah, that was crazy. So, um, so yeah, that was the last research project that came up in Arizona. And then I moved to Nebraska in at the end of August um, to be the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager. And up to about a couple of weeks ago, things have been pretty slow. You know, I don't want to say slow, they've been busy, but fairly typical trying to respond to requests and looking for zebra mussels and Asian carp. Um, but all that changed two weeks ago. So I got an urgent email from the feds, uh, from USGS, that a Petco employee in Seattle, Washington had found zebra mussels um, which are a very invasive species we have here in Nebraska and across the country, inside moss balls or merino balls sold as aquarium plants. Um, so that was sort of something that no one ever thinks about and was kind of crazy to think. So, um, and then, you know, they said they've been finding these moss balls in the beta buddies with zebra mussels in there. And the concern is that if people dump these out, flush them down the drain, they can spread zebra mussels to our waterways in a pathway that we never thought about. So, so um, I got that email and uh, you know, within two hours I was at our Petco locations here in Lincoln. Um, you know, and you kind of expect, I mean, where are the odds it's gonna be here in Nebraska? You know, this is probably just a West Coast thing. Um, yeah, no, I actually found moss balls with zebra mussels at the very first store I went to. And it wasn't just one, it was, it was, it was uh, a bunch of containers. So, um, yeah, it's been a kind of crazy couple of weeks, and this has been kind of a nationwide thing. Um, you know, they've been found at stores from um, Alaska to Florida. I'm actually, I, I, I'm, so I actually found in all states except Hawaii right now, because um, Hawaii has very strict importation rules um, for algae products. So this is actually a ball of algae formed uh, naturally in lakes in the Ukraine. And in Ukraine, uh, zebra mussels are native. So this was kind of uh, a gap in the armor, as they say, um, on the kind of the higher up level that kind of allowed these to get into, you know, the United States and then distribute it all around. So, um, but yeah, so it's been a crazy few weeks trying to look around to all the stores in Nebraska that sell fish, trying to contact people and putting out aquarium guidance because, yeah, this is a really concerning thing about um, invasive species that people maybe could be unknowingly spreading them. So um, this, yeah, so this is the last slide I have. So I just want to follow up um, with some general guidance that if you have a moss ball in your aquarium, the best thing is to take it out and freeze it completely, you know, at least for a day. Um, and then do a good water change on your tank, you know, remove your fish, use different water in that thing. Um, use one cup of bleach per gallon of water and let everything soak for 10 minutes. The biggest thing is to make sure you dump the water outside, um, you know, away from the water source, you know, in your yard, or your gravel. Um, and then put your tank back together and kind of monitor your tank for six months, because if there are zebra mussels in your tank, um, it's going to cause problems, it, it, you know, so, and if you can contact us, if you have any uh, guidance or um, if you have any um, questions on that, um, I'd be happy to answer anything you have. So um, with that, I'll take any other questions you may have. Um, here's my email address and my phone number. Um, yeah, if, if anyone's interested after this and, you know, you know, has another prison, uh, has another question they don't think about. Um, just about, you know, 
you know, about, you know, aquatic species or how to get, you know, an internship and stuff like that, um, I'd be happy to answer that too. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to either type them in the chat. You can private message me and or Chris or the group. Um, and also, if you would like to unmute yourself, please feel free to do that as well. Otherwise, we do have some from classes that couldn't be here today, but did come up with some questions. So, um, yeah, but does anyone else have any questions before we get into those? Okay, um, well, we'll go ahead and uh, some of the classes that couldn't be here today, but they were interested, um, they had some good questions for you. Um, one of them was what, now that you're kind of an invasive species person, what is the percentage of your job that you are out in the field versus in uh, the office or that kind of stuff? Hey, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, for me, in a typical year, it'd be very, very seasonal. So during the summer, you know, we hire technicians every summer to do boat inspections. So, you know, during the summer, I'm going to be out, you know, doing samples for Asian carp and zebra mussels. Uh, during the winter months, it's more, you know, in the office and things like that. I know I'd say I probably, I'm overall spend a, ma a majority time in my office, but not by much, but, you know, being out there in the field. But again, then there's times like, uh, you know, the past couple of weeks where I've literally been chasing uh, these moss balls for the past two straight weeks. And I haven't been in the office. So um, I've been going all around the state of Nebraska. So yeah, a, a lot of that's very um, dependent or very crisis, you know, stuff like that. So, but yeah, that's a great question. Cause you know, kind of the rule of thumb is kind of the higher you up the food chain, the less time you get to spend outside. This kind of, you know, it, it, you know, cause once you're the director or the supervisor or something, you don't get a lot of time to spend out there. So I'm thankful my job kind of has a good mix of that, so. Um, another question is, what do you um, personally look for if you were to hire someone, like an intern or a seasonal or temporary position? What are you really looking for, like on a resume or experience wise? Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's been kind of interesting to, you know, once I got my job in Arizona, I kind of switched hats where I was starting to hire people, you know, and be on panels and stuff like that and, you know, hiring my own interns. So um, I'll tell you what I looked for when I hired my two interns in Arizona and, you know, and for our, the positions here in Nebraska. Um, it's not necessarily you have to have a ton of experience. So both of my, bo both of my interns I hired in Arizona had a little to no experience working with aquatic, you know, some species. Um, but, you know, they, they were very excited about the opportunity. And that's one thing I look for is someone who's really excited and, you know, wants to learn anything, you know, and, you know, stuff like that. That's one big thing I've learned um, that I look for is just that kind of excitement and the willingness to learn and, you know, and, you know, and actually both my interns aren't working with aquatic species. So one's uh, up in Glacier National Park and one's going to vet school. So I don't know if that's good or bad that all my interns don't work with fish, but, um, or maybe it's, um, but yeah, and that's that's something I look for is, is just being kind of a go-getter, e even if you don't have the experience, you know, that's the biggest thing. So, because I did have experience once as well, you know, and someone took a chance on me. So, you know, you know that's one thing I always think about when hiring, so. That's funny that you say that because other people have said, make sure you get a lot of experience. So it's kind of nice to hear from both sides. Like, obviously you don't want someone that's a computer science major that's never spent a yeah. day outside in their life, but mm -hmm. also um, it's nice to hear that you don't have to have 40 years of experience to get that seasonal or temporary position, so. Yeah, no, and I, I guess I, I got my first position not, not doing anything before, you know, I, I learned how to drive a boat, I learned how to, you know, I didn't know a lot of this stuff, and I was able to learn on the job, which, you know, is really helpful, so yeah, you don't need a ton of, you know, for the higher positions, yeah, you know, you do need experience, but for these more entry level ones, I think it's not it's not a deal breaker at all. So good to hear. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, we just have a maybe like one or two more, but I don't want to take away if someone wants to put it in the chat or if you want to unmute yourselves. Um, Chris, maybe you want to stop sharing your screen and okay. then we can uh, see your face and. I will say one question I get asked a lot is, "What's the strangest thing I've encountered while sampling for fish?" Um, and I don't know about the strangest thing, but one time uh, we were electrofishing um, and we surprised a beaver 
And he was not happy. That was probably the most angry I've ever seen a beaver in my life. And he made the loudest noise with his paddle on the water I think I've ever heard. So that, that kind of scared us a little bit. So it, yeah, it, you know, it, it didn't hurt him, but you know, he felt it in the water from far away and was not, was not happy, so. <laughs> That's funny. I had a weird angry beaver encounter as well when I was out doing some fish sampling too. But I don't know. They must just not be happy when people are out there. But. Yeah. Um, and then we just had one more question. Um, someone kind of wanted to know like what is the job market for invasive species positions or aquatic invasives? There's a lot of them or do you have to kind of is it almost like a partnership position where you, you'll you do fish or, or land animals, but then also work with invasives, that kind of thing? Uh, it depends on the state. So, you know, in each state, there's one designated um, invasive, aquatic invasive species kind of lead. So that's for, you know, stuff like these moss balls that we can have, you know, one person for the state. That being said, aquatic invasive species, um, in my opinion, is not a market that's going to decline. It's going to grow. Um, you know, un unfortunately, we have more and more threats, you know, you, you know, kind of coming into our waterways and stuff like that, where, you know, especially with Asian carp, there's a lot of work being done on the state, you know, what we're doing here in Nebraska and in other states. So um, I, I would say, you know, coming from the native, you know, the native world, you know, that that's a world that is not in high demand because there's not a lot of positions. There's not a lot of states that work with native fish and have sole biologists to do that, you know. So comparing that to aquatic invasive species and invasive species in general, you know, is, 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 a, is a field that is, um, in my opinion, gonna be growing because there are always gonna be new threats. You know, we never thought about moss balls. So, um, you know, there, there could be something else that pops up tomorrow where we need to increase staff and, and stuff like that. So that's my opinion at least, so. I mean, that's good. There'll be a lot more positions, but not good at the same time. Yeah. It means there's more invasives, but. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword with that, but. Uh, someone wanted to know, uh, how big is a paddlefish? You know, I don't know exactly how big they can get. Um, I know they can get well over a hundred pounds. You know, the ones I caught were around 90 pounds. So they can get really, really large, so. 90 pounds, wow. Yep, okay. yep, 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 those are the ones that we sampled um, in Oklahoma. But I do know they get larger than that. So um, yeah, I, but I don't know the exact number, but yeah, they get pretty big, so. Huh. Uh, someone else also wanted to know, um, what is your favorite project that you have worked on with your job? Um, I'm gonna, I'm, you said, cause I've kind of been short in Oklahoma, um, in, Oklahoma, in Nebraska. So kind of my favorite project I've worked on you know, it's, it's probably that weird project I mentioned talking about how to save bony tailed chub and zebra mus. Uh, no, see, see I, I got invasive species on my mind uh, and Razorback Sucker. Because um, I kind of, you know, I, and I say we, we had a research center, but we had a staff of three. And I, and I was the only research person. The other people were more hatchery stuff. So, um, so I, I pretty much just did it all myself. So, um, and that can be nice because you can do everything yourself, but it can be bad because you're you're the only person that can do that. Um, so yeah, when I got to design that experiment and convince people to buy uh, you know Botox and try this weird thing I thought of and it you know actually worked was that that was really cool you know because you know you can kind of be a mad scientist. So I kind of had fun being you know doing that. So. Someone wanted to know, um, they have a degree in environmental biology um, and they currently work in a lab testing water and soil. Um, mm -hmm. They don't really have an experience working outdoors. What would you suggest would be a step in changing from the lab work to the field work? Gotcha, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I would start by trying to find one of these seasonal, you know, or summer positions and pretty much, you know, what what you're most interested in, you know, you know, like, you know, like I've said, I've I've done a lot in my career that I had no training on, you know, and I think part of it is able to relate, you know, like you have experience working with, you know, water and soil and how you can relate that back to another job. Like, you knew, you know, like you understand the chemistry behind it and that prepares you for being a better, you know, for, you know, working better as a technician or something like that. So, um, yeah, I would just look for, you know, and there's a lot of different, you know, positions out there where maybe it's maybe a more like a hybrid too, you, you get some field work. Um, or if you, you know, really want to get some experience too, um, you, you can always volunteer. 
peer um, with, you know, with FEMA parks or with somebody else too, you know, you can go help our biologists, you know, go sample fish or come sample zebra mussels, or I'm sure our wildlife guys, you know, would be happy to, you know, take people out too. So yeah, those are just a couple ideas I have, so. Good, awesome. Um, well, is there anything else that you kind of would like to say to people that would like to get into the world of either um, like field research or biology mm -hmm. or aquatic invasive species, anything else that you just kind of want to say and kind of wrap up or anything? Um, a couple, yeah, I, you know, kind of, you know, one thing I always talk about, you know, in my job is what got helped me get my position is um, compared to other biologists is I, I really nerd out on aquatic plants which is not something a lot of people do, but for an aquatic based species, it's kind of a big deal. And, I, and that's actually helped me a lot in my career. And it's not really a exciting thing to study. So I guess one thing I always tell people is kind of embrace your weird, you know, like if you're really passionate about something, um, you know, to, to, you know, I found a lot of times in my job, you know, taking different jobs, my experience with aquatic, you know, veg, that, you know, that was one thing that was unique about me, you know, and that's something I could bring to the table that um, not many people have. So if you're really interested in, I don't know, zooplankton or snails or something, you know, like that's something that you can use to your benefit, you know, and your passion. So, and the, and the last thing I'll wrap up, my, uh, my old mentor in Iowa would be mad if I didn't mention it. So on my very first day of work, when I was my very first internship, my boss told me one thing. He says, and he said, remember where you came from, meaning that at one point, you were a scared 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old kid who didn't know a single thing about fish and driving boats and stuff. So, you know, and that's something I, I tell my interns on their first date now too. So, cause yeah, it, you know, eventually like me, you're gonna be hiring interns, you know and Monica talked about kind of hiring, you know people with a ton of experience versus not a lot, you know and I think that kind of shapes the way I, it, it, you know use stuff and you know, that, that's sort of my last thing is eventually you'll be a big wig and just remember where you came from, so. <laughs> Very good advice. I love that you said embrace your weird because we're yeah. all, you know, scientists and nature people, naturalists, that's that's how we get these jobs and that's why you got, yeah, I, I love that, so good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, if anyone um, would like to either share this if you couldn't make it today or has someone that would really like to see this, we are gonna post these on our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. Um, it will be under something called, the playlist called um, Conservation Career Chats. Um, you'll also find one that we did last month with Sean Dunn, who was a zoologist. And then our first one that we did in January was um, Amanda Philippi, who is a environmental educator out in Western Nebraska. So we have quite the, um, range of uh, careers so far, but please join us next time. Um, April, I think it is also like April 20th, I think, or 17th. Um, it's on our Facebook page um, and you can, the Nebraska Wildlife Education Facebook page. Um, it will be Travis Shepler, who is a conservation officer um, or a game warden, sometimes they're called, uh, for the state of Nebraska. So he should have some good stories and some good um, insight into that career as well. Otherwise, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, thank you, Chris, for doing this. Um, this was good and I, I hope people got something from it. So thank you very much. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone. We will hopefully see you next month. Thank you.